if you could be any glyph, which would you be and why? A lowercase a, um, because I like drawing them. I think I will be a number, a number eight. Um, I don't know exactly why, probably because it has like a, some kind of pattern that I like. I have a soft spot for case, but that's probably just my last name. Hmm. Well, G is more exciting than K. I like G's. Lowercase or uppercase? Yeah, 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 sorry. I'm always thinking lowercase first. I know that this is different with Americans or UK people, that they are very uppercase C, but uh, the Germans are very lowercase C. Although you have many more uppercase, use of uppercase in German. Yeah, but um, I don't know. You don't see so much uppercase settings around in newspapers or on on buildings or signs. So it's it's usually mixed case. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, caps, but in the beginning of the word. Your interest and involvement involvement in classifying system it started <laughs> some time ago, mm -hmm. like some good time ago. Uh, so I'm curious how it changed and how your views of it changed because you probably changed as well. Um, yes, and I think it really you could say it started with the systematical head part where I thought, oh, this is awesome. It's, it's just systematical, and you go through, and you can have you have the terms for everything, and it, everything is so clear and easy. But of course, as soon as you start using the typefaces, you see it's it's you can also design with the same typeface in totally different ways. And now I'm, um, maybe it's also because I'm teaching for a long time, is that I'm not even thinking about how is this maybe correct for us experts, but how do other people who know nothing want to find the typefaces? So I'm always thinking about how do you want to find the typeface, like getting it out of the shelf and not how do you want to sort it for putting it in the shelf. I think this is something that uh, a lot of people who classified typefaces before were not really thinking about. It was more like, how do I like um, sort it from an expert point of view and not really from the user point of view. There's so much about perception or atmosphere in a typeface that's not really rational features that you can classify only. That's also part of, for instance, with the font stand sorting. Of course, you could think, oh, can you not automatize this, or like, the, can you not read this off the font files? But it's uh, like some typefaces just—it's—it's uh, it's very easy to do it, like as a person, like uh, manually. And um, I'm not sure if you would get the same result from a machine if you just follow parameters. It's exactly the difference between like emotions and what comes out of a typeface. You sometimes talk about like this is sorted as this and this, like it's yeah. not black and white or like corns exactly well this is something that was that is also changed since i first started working or got interested in that is that if you work digital and work with a database it's so easy to assign the same uh, assign different labels or terms to one typeface and previously if you have a physical object you can only put the object in one place at a time if you now for instance we're talking about metal type you had to put it in one of the cases, either the cases of the sans or the cases of the serifs, even if it's semi-serif or something. But if you're talking about a digital typeface, you can find it from the, like selecting sans from the menu or from serif if it's fitting. So whatever approach you're coming from, that's the, that's the really good thing about digital um, goods. Like anyway, it's not just fonts, of course. Yeah, so th things are becoming more flexible, but might come might become more confusing as well. That's also true. Yeah. And um, I think as, especially for beginners, if you are very detailed in the in the different ways and expressions and uh, also a, a very complex filtering system, then a beginner is, of course, totally overwhelmed by this. That's why I always try to, like the first level can be as easy as sans or serif because I made some tests with people who have no experience with fonts really and, and let them like make piles of, of stuff. And I think the serif and sans, that was the most obvious that everyone did. And then the next most obvious thing was the stroke contrast and even much more than I thought they they were they identified little differences in a sense serif where you think yeah no this is just optical corrections that's not even you're not supposed to see that but then everything what we are 
calling like these genres, like if this is now a, a renaissance or a, a, a baroque tapest, they don't see that at all. So this is something that you have to add much later to the game. It should be very basic for the people who don't have don't have much knowledge and maybe really fine grained for the people who are very uh, specifically uh, searching for something. Do we really need a classifying system? I mean, do we really need to classify typefaces? No, but we have to filter the like the pool of typeface somehow. I, I'm not so into the term classification system anymore because firstly, the systems are always, if you call it a system, it sounds like a like a fixed thing, which is just not working like this anymore. But uh, I mean, just if you yeah, think of a font catalog online, there has to be some way to filter down your choices, otherwise you weren't just not finding anything. And uh, having an alphabetical font menu is of really no help if you're looking for something specific. So it's it's more maybe let's if maybe it's just a friendlier and less horrible term filtering system. But it's also coming from the user who wants to filter down stuff and the classification that sounds something like the the scientist does and uh, uh, like a, a dogmatic yeah. truth. Yes, and that's uh, um, that's the thing that it's. Uh, uh, I want it to be less dogmatic, but maybe people even perceive the, the work that I do in the field as too dogmatic already. I mean, you can read these comments on Twitter sometimes. <laughs> so what do you feel about the, this uh, popular filter, which is called popular? I think that's very helpful for, for me sometimes. That's uh, the filter uh, where I see the typefaces I don't want to use because <laughs> I'm probably usually someone who's always thinking of how oh, I made the alternative choice that uh, <laughs> the, the sophisticated typeface that no one else is using. But um, of course, like for me personally, something like newest or most popular is interesting just to see like I, I check out what are the latest fonts that were added somewhere to see what's what's new. The popular is just interesting to see what's what are the trends out there, what are people using. Not that I personally just want to avoid these typefaces, but it's always interesting to see, oh my God, it's all sans serifs in the charts, for instance. Almost on every single type site, it's if you have like on my fonts 50, the 50 most popular fonts, so it's probably 45 uh, sans serif typefaces. I mean, that says something and that's that's maybe informative. I, I think it, but it also, it, it feeds itself popular because mm -hmm. you, you search for the popular and then you buy the popular and then someone else will search the popular and buy the popular, so it, it never ends. Yeah, totally. But as I said, like we maybe look at this list and see what we don't want to use, but other people, a lot of people look at these lists and because I don't know what to choose. So what's, what do the other people use? And then they feel safe that if they just use the same typeface. Yeah, it's self perpetuating. Or maybe the editor's pick would be like a good way yeah. also to filter. Although, I mean, you have these editor picks on large commercial sites, which are a little bit also um, going in the direction of trends. But for instance, some sites have something like hidden gems. I, I like that, for instance, this is if you'd be interested in uh, that sorting on fonts. It's just a, a font send is a site that I, uh, an app that I know of now know by heart, of course. There's this tab called hidden gems and that is actually the reverse chart. So these are the least selling fonts. But it's interesting because you think like, oh, these are great typefaces. Why do, does no one license those typefaces? But uh, that's, that's a way of looking at the charts from the other direction, which I find interesting. Yes, and also naming it hidden gem rather than unpopular typefaces or yeah. that no one used this typeface. So. No, it's exactly this. This is like, I'm, this is also good typefaces, but you didn't pay attention to them before or didn't find them the, the, the best choice for something. But you can, can consider maybe one of these choices. When you teach, you teach both from the inside and from the outside, and I'll explain. Uh, you <laughs> teach from the inside in your university, so you know your students and the, the, um, the process is kind of continuous. You meet them every week, you meet them every class, and you, you get to know them. And from the outside is when you teach when you come to conferences. 
you give mm-hmm. a talk, you mm-hmm. give a workshop, and and that's it, and then you're done. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering how these two, uh, let's say, uh, approaches or directions of teaching, uh, how do they live together? Do they complete each other, or they're that's very interesting. Yeah, because um, sometimes I have the feeling that my school, they don't really know that I'm talking about uh, at, at so many conferences or what I'm talking about there and sometimes when I went back to school I sometimes think like oh the talk that I just gave on the weekend that would be so interesting to my students too why am why am I not giving these talks at school as well because I'm not we we don't really have this lecturing so that I stand in the front and lecture for 45 minutes that's not what you usually do in design school And then I think like it's it's really weird that this is so disconnected that almost like almost none of the things that I do in workshops or in a talk I also do in school and the other way around also not really that comes together sometimes when I take students with me to conferences it's really something that I notice and I'm I'm surprised that you also notice this or sense that because I think I have to connect this a little bit better and maybe just have like a An evening lecture sometimes it doesn't have to fit into the usual curricula but the way I could almost just give the conference talks because they are they could also be interesting for my students sometimes they're of course in English so I have to translate it for the German schools but that's not the biggest problem and then they will see like a new Indra with the an evening gone gown coming oh. to, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> to speak. I mean I, I I don't know if they ever watch these videos of me giving talks I, I remember that there was a live stream for typographics in June and I sent the link to a colleague of mine because she was interested in it and and she watched it and she approached me the week after when we were in school and there were a huge round of students around me and she was oh I watched your talk live stream from New York and and she asked the students did you also watch it and they were all like um, what conference and I mean I told them about it but none of my students has watched it so it was a little they they were all a little bit oh um Uh, are we now getting bad marks that we didn't watch the talk? I don't request them to come to the conferences or watch the talks or anything. I don't even recommend my books to my students because I think it's some if they want to know what I'm doing the rest of the week, they can easily find this. I'm not imposing this on them. Kind of your weekend, actually, not the rest of the week. <laughs> well, sometimes it's during the week, sometimes it's on the weekend, yeah. I think some, some of the differences are also inherent to the, the kind of job like I said yeah. like you're meeting them regularly you kind of know who you're teaching maybe it's also easier to not like give a give a lecture and kind of that's also depending on the school of course a little we are a very small school which is very I I would say oh, like all design schools practice based it's not that I'm lecturing for 90 minutes and then they have to go home and figure it out themselves we're usually in a discussion round and they're showing the designs and we critiquing critiquing it and sometimes I have small mini talks uh, in the beginning but it's not that's not the most part of the um, the the teaching it's really sometimes you could almost describe it as, as hanging out together and talking about the stuff is like even in the evening sometimes with a beer or so or two what would you like the ATIPI attendees to take home with them from the conference I like watching the talks and then you talk about the things that you saw in the coffee break or on the way here or in the evening we're all having dinner together afterwards or, or drinks or something like this and then it's it's, it's just uh, like the talks are more like sparking the conversations afterwards and that's also what I thought would be could happen or what happened in, on the first day that I moderated the business track not so much that I uh, um, um, announced the talks in the general um, conference because I have to admit that I find the forum days are actually the more interesting ones and the, the more fringe presentations and I I wish it was just the forum days the whole conference I'm the hidden gems yeah something like this yeah the uh, less you I wish it was a little less research presentation sometimes, but I'm also giving these kind of talks, so I should uh, uh, what do you say like uh, eat my own advice in that that having like um, conversation sparking presentations. <laughs>